For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. Canyoneering, also known as canyoning, is an exhilarating outdoor sport that involves navigating through canyons using a combination of hiking, climbing, rappelling, and swimming. While canyoneering can be an incredible and rewarding experience, like any outdoor activity, danger is just around the corner. Flash flooding, rappelling hazards, rockfall, and hypothermia are a few of the potential dangers that lurk when embarking on this challenging activity. Click the subscribe and like buttons. This is Outdoor Disasters. Zion National Park is undeniably breathtaking and considered one of the most beautiful national parks in the world. Its beauty is a result of the unique combination of towering sandstone cliffs, deep canyons, lush vegetation, and the Virgin River winding through the landscape. The park's distinct geological formations and diverse scenery create an awe-inspiring experience for visitors. The sheer magnitude of the sandstone cliffs with colors ranging from deep reds to creamy whites is a sight to behold. The way sunlight plays on these massive rock formations throughout the day creates a dynamic and visually stunning environment. The contrast between the colorful cliffs and the clear blue skies is striking, making every viewpoint a picture-perfect moment. The Narrows, with its towering canyon walls and the Virgin River running through it, is a highlight of Zion's beauty. Wading through the water with sheer cliffs rising hundreds of feet on both sides provides a unique and immersive experience that is unparalleled in other national parks. In addition to the geological wonders, the diverse plant life, especially during the spring when wildflowers bloom, adds vibrancy and color to the landscape. The emerald pools and their cascading waterfalls offer a refreshing and tranquil oasis amidst the rugged terrain. Furthermore, the dark skies at night offer an entirely different kind of beauty. Stargazing in Zion National Park is a magical experience with a clear view of the Milky Way and countless stars twinkling overhead. The seasonal changes also contribute to Zion's beauty, with each season bringing its own charm. Whether it's the fresh greenery in spring, the vibrant colors of autumn, or the stark beauty of winter, every time of year offers a different perspective on the park's natural splendor. Ultimately, the beauty of Zion National Park is a testament to the incredible forces of nature that shaped its landscape over millions of years. The park's striking vistas, unique hiking opportunities, and diverse ecosystems make it a destination that leaves visitors in awe of the natural world and eager to return to experience its beauty again and again. For one group of hikers, their Zion slot canyoneering adventure would be a tragedy. Zion National Park, with its towering Navajo sandstone walls and plunging network of gorges carved by the Virgin River, is the American ground zero for canyoneering, and Keyhole is considered an ideal introduction. Five minutes off the park's Zion Mount Carmel Highway, the slot canyon is only 1,200 feet long and requires just three 30-foot rappels and a bit of scrambling and swimming through the cold pools that collect year-round beneath its smooth, narrow walls. We like to say that canyoneering isn't an extreme sport unless you're not very smart about it. In a way, it's more dangerous than rock climbing because once you start into a canyon, you're committed to coming out the bottom. Whereas in rock climbing, you have to have some competency to get up high enough to get into trouble, says Tom Jones, a former Zion Adventure Company guide. Canyoneering's complicated rope work, chilly swims, and infrequent glimpses of the sky actually make it more similar to spelunking. Canyoneers don wetsuits and harnesses and sometimes even headlamps as they hike, rappel, and swim their way through tight spaces. The group of seven hikers, six from California, had been planning their descent into the canyon for months. Gary Favela, Don Teichner, Muku Reynolds, Steve Arthur, Linda Arthur, Robin Brum, and Mark McKenzie had extensive hiking experience. All but one took a five-hour canyoneering class offered by the local Zion Adventure Company on Monday morning of September 15, 2015. While three men and three women started the class, Mark McKenzie, the one with canyoneering experience, went down the road to the Park Visitors Center and bought a $15 permit to descend into Keyhole that day. All of them were in their 50s, and many had met through the Valencia Hiking Crew, a meetup.com group that organizes outings ranging from strolls through downtown Los Angeles to long hikes in Joshua Tree National Park. We are not a beginner hiking group, 
a small amount of danger or risk while still being safe can also add to a hike's enjoyment, Don Teichner, one of the club's founders, said. After completing their rappelling course, the six friends rejoined Mackenzie. They were well aware of the potential for flash floods. Just after noon, Teichner called his wife from the Watchman campground where the group was staying. The campground sits just at the edge of cell service within the park. At 11.52 a.m., Mackenzie texted his son from Watchman. Eating lunch, this is my view. Maybe keyhole this afternoon. He attached a photo that showed with seemingly innocuous cumulus clouds wisping by. That March, Mackenzie had spent a week canyoneering in Zion with his other son, Ryan, completing keyhole and a handful of additional slots, including heaps, one of the park's longest and most difficult descents. At 1.30 p.m., the seven packed their gear into Teichner's and the Arthur's pickup trucks and drove nine miles to the parking pullout for keyhole. From the road, the sky is visible to the south and west, but the horizon is obscured by walls of white sandstone. What they could see probably represented the next half hour's worth of weather. What they couldn't see was the towering anvil cloud that was just passing from southwest to northeast. At about 2 p.m., they drove into the park toward the canyon and lost their cell phone coverage, snacked in the parking lot, then headed up the slick rock sandstone, about a five-minute walk to the drop-in point for Keyhole. The upper portion of Keyhole Canyon is relatively flat with only a couple hundred feet of light scrambling and is where the seven posed for a photo. Teichner, who moved from Southern California to Nevada in the spring, stood in the foreground, his right foot straddling a boulder. Steve and Linda Arthur, grandparents of seven, wrapped arms with Robin Brum, a hairstylist from their hometown, Camarillo. Muku Reynolds, who often looked for heart-shaped rocks on her hikes, peeked from behind. Gary Favela, an experienced camper, hiker, and skier from Rancho Cucamonga, leaned in on the left. Mark McKenzie, saddled with a bright red pack, framed them on the right. It was a picture of ease, of warmth and unpretentiousness, as they prepared to go deeper into the canyon. Less than an hour after the California group received a permit to Keyhole, the weather service raised the chance of rain to 50%. At the Zion Visitor Center, a ranger wrote on a cardboard sign near the wilderness desk that flash flooding that day was probable. Rangers also informed people verbally when they sought permits later in the day. 20 minutes later, the weather service issued a flash flood warning for Southeast Zion, the area that includes Keyhole. Move to higher ground now, act quickly to protect your life, the service forecasters wrote with their typical uppercase intensity. At this point, the warning would be too late for the canyoneers in Keyhole to receive it. Soon afterward, the slot opens up again, the last place where a party could decide to bail out before the first rappel takes canyoneers down into the dark, narrow slot itself. The group proceeded down the first rappel and were enjoying their adventure so far. There was a lot of laughing and cheering and they were having a great time, Jim Clary, another canyoneering in Keyhole that day. Favela and Mackenzie were still at the top when clearly arrived at the first rappel. They saw us coming up and they said hello seemed pretty friendly. Honestly, I didn't want to be behind a group that big in that canyon on a day like that and it's kind of common courtesy in Zion to let smaller, quicker groups pass. So I asked, do you mind if we play through? Mackenzie told him that would be fine. At that point, they all could have still exited the canyon, but there was no sign of danger. They could see a sliver of sky and it was blue. Before Clary's group moved past, most of the Valencia group had completed the first rappel. Favela was next, but he'd inadvertently set up his rope for a left-handed descent. Mackenzie helped him fix it. Clary noticed that the Valencia group was using a technique called toss and go, the basic rappel in which the entire rope is looped through a carabiner, allowing people to descend on the doubled strand. It's simple and safe, but slower than the single strand binder block method Clary's party was using since it requires the entire bag of rope to be unfurled and repacked at each rappel. Clary slid down the rope in a smooth motion and unclipped. He ran ahead and set up his rope at the second rappel and then ran back to see Favela descending. While the Valencia group repacked their rope, Clary's party went ahead. That was the last contact the two groups had. 20 minutes later, the storm reached Zion. Deep in Keyhole, the canyoneers still had no idea that a flash flood warning had been issued. At the third rappel, everything changed. A clear, close thunderclap peeled down the canyon walls. I got my brother-in-law Rob off the rope and I told him, just go, 
Jim Cleary said. Rob took off downstream, swimming through a six-foot-deep, shoulder-width hallway. They knew once we got through the three rappels, we had five minutes of canyon and were out. Once I heard that thunder, I stopped looking up because I knew I was going to go as fast as we could, Cleary said. Cleary understood that the seven people above his group might save a few minutes if he left his rope up for them, but he'd used the single-strand binder block technique, and he remembered that the Valencia group was using a double strand. I was afraid that it would confuse them and maybe slow them down, so I pulled my rope and started moving down canyon, Cleary said. Cleary's brother and brother-in-law had stopped at a six-foot down climb because it had gotten too dark to see. About halfway between the third rappel and the exit, it began to rain. There was no front edge to the storm. It switched on like a fire hose. It came down hard. Rain. Hail. That's as fast as I've ever seen it change, with as little warning as I've ever seen, Jim said. Waterfalls of runoff began pouring in. They had 50 yards to go. Gradually, the walls of the canyon backed off enough that they could climb up and out of the stagnant pools, which were stirring to life and beginning to flow. It had been raining for five minutes. By the time Clary and his brother-in-law reached the road, the water was at least waist-deep, racing through the ten-foot-wide culvert that carried it under the road and into Clear Creek, a flow of several hundred cubic feet per second. There's this adrenaline rush coming through that we just made it, Jim said. At that point, they realized there was no way the group above them could have escaped. The men climbed into their truck and drove to the nearest ranger kiosk, a mile to the west at the entrance to the Zion Mount Carmel Tunnel. The ranger on duty tried the radio to relay their report, but the frequency was jammed with traffic. The roads were covered in mud, and small landslides were coming down from the mountains. They continued on toward Springdale and encountered a second ranger at a series of steep switchbacks just after the tunnel, and informed him of the event unfolding at Keyhole, but the ranger didn't seem really interested in talking with Clary and ushered him through. From the Park Service's point of view, all hell had just broken loose. Flooding, mudslides, rock falls, trees coming down. On that day in September, the park would have had more than 10,000 visitors, with a monsoonal storm engulfing a packed Zion National Park. 20 minutes later, the storm let up, and blue skies above again. And a search for the Valencia Canyoneering Group commenced. One day later, Caden Anderson, a 25-year-old off-duty canyoneering guide, was leading two friends, India and Jay Piacitelli. The couple had gotten married two days earlier, overlooking the Grand Canyon's horseshoe bend. And they decided to honeymoon their way home through Utah's national parks. The Anderson Group was in the canyon illegally as the Park Service closed permitting into Keyhole following the incident. The rescuers hadn't checked Keyhole for the missing canyoneers because water levels were still too high. As the trio came to a rappel ledge peering over the edge, they could make out something submerged in the small pool below. When we saw the leg sticking out, we didn't know what it was and joked about it, India said. Caden decides to descend to take a closer look. The rope descended 30 feet terminating in a mess in the muddy pool. A shoe was tangled up in the line. Anderson grabbed it only to find that it was attached to a person floating in the murky water. Checking for life, he flipped the body over and saw a middle-aged male whose skin was cold and white. It was obvious that he was dead, says Anderson. I yelled back up at my friends, there's a body down here. Earlier in the day, rescuers found Steve Arthur's body, roughly a mile downstream in Clear Creek. As the creek bed returned to its normal dry state, more victims turned up in the area and beyond. And by the late evening two days later, the bodies of all seven of the lost canyoneers would be found. Don Teichner, the group's leader, a 55-year-old who was semi-retired from managing his family's garment dyeing facility in Los Angeles, 59-year-old Muku Reynolds, a special education aide from Chino, 53-year-old Robin Brum, a hairstylist from Camarillo, Mark McKenzie, 56, a system operator for Burbank Water and Power, and Gary Favela, the man Anderson and the Piazzatellis discovered, a 51-year-old sales rep from Rancho Cucamonga. The final victim, Steve Arthur's wife, Linda, had traveled the farthest, five miles downstream, through the Clear Creek drainage into Pine Creek Canyon. All were found in separate places downstream. No one was left to tell the story of what exactly happened. The same storm also stunned an isolated Mormon fundamentalist community about 20 miles to the south. 
Three adults and nine children were killed when floodwaters rushed out of a canyon outside Hilldale. Another child is still missing. The Keyhole disaster left the park's rangers badly shaken. It left the families of the dead wondering whether their loved ones had somehow been reckless or misinformed. And it left veteran canyoneers speculating about just how this kind of thing could have happened. The most innocuous slot in Zion had produced the worst canyoneering disaster in American history and the worst accident of any kind in Zion's 97 years. Many questioned why beginners would be allowed in the canyon on their own. Zion doesn't allow any technical guidance inside its boundaries. The reason, as with many park regulations, primarily comes down to tradition. No guides were working these canyons in 1919 when Zion was officially protected, so there was no lobby to argue for a concession. In 2007, when the park updated its wilderness management plan, the rangers determined that even though demand for guides existed, there were 3.6 million visitors in 2015, with roughly 60,000 of those obtaining backcountry permits. The park had more than enough traffic without them. In a public opinion poll, 82% of respondents voted against commercial guiding. At Zion, there are very few places where rangers will tell you not to do something for your own safety. If you want to climb the giant sandstone walls or descend the steep canyons, it's up to you to learn the skills and look out for yourself. People make their own decisions about risk and accept the consequences, which can be swift and severe. It was one of the deadliest days of weather in Utah's history. Allison Botcher, Steve and Linda, Arthur's daughter said, this wasn't a reckless group. These were parents and grandparents and people who had loved ones at home. They cared about the wilderness and they know how powerful it can be. There is no way they would have gone in there if they had any thought in their mind it could be dangerous. There's just no way they wouldn't have done it. Her brother Bobby Arthur said, I think the hardest part for my family was that they found my dad first and my mom last. That was just brutal. The Arthurs had been married for 37 years. They'd met right out of high school at the Topanga Mall. Mom worked at Orange Julius and dad worked at Florsheim, says Allison. Both Bobby and Allison are convinced that when the flood hit, their father would have told their mother to go as fast as she could and then stay behind to help. My dad, being the person that he is, I'm sure he told everybody to get out, says Allison. He would stay with Gary, help him down the last rappel. Canyoneering allows you to explore and discover hidden and remote places that are often inaccessible by other means. You get to immerse yourself in the beauty of nature and encounter unique geological formations and landscapes. If you find yourself caught in a flash flood while in a slot canyon, it's essential to prioritize your safety and take immediate action to increase your chances of survival. Flash floods can cause water levels to rise rapidly, so the first priority is to find higher ground. Move quickly to the highest possible point in the canyon, away from the path of the floodwater. If you're aware of a flash flood warning or suspect that conditions are favorable for flooding, avoid narrow passages in the canyon. These areas can quickly become death traps during flash floods. If you can't reach higher ground, try to climb on any available surface and cling to the walls. Avoid being in the middle of the canyon where the force of the flood water is strongest. Avoid getting near waterfalls or drops where the water can be particularly forceful. Repelling down waterfalls during a flash flood is extremely dangerous. If the water is rising quickly, try to move laterally along the canyon wall instead of against the current. It might be easier to navigate this way. Once you've reached higher ground or climbed to a safer location, wait for the flood waters to recede before attempting to move again. Flash floods can be intense but relatively short-lived. If you have any signaling devices or gear, use them to attract the attention of rescuers. Yell for help if you believe others might be nearby. If you are part of a group, stay together and support one another. It's easier for rescuers to find a group than individuals scattered across the canyon. Remember that flash floods can occur suddenly, even if it's not raining in the immediate vicinity. It's crucial to check weather forecasts and flash flood warnings before embarking on any canyoneering or hiking activity in slot canyons. Always be prepared for changing conditions and have an emergency plan in place. If you're unsure about the conditions or your abilities, consider joining guided canyoneering trips led by experienced professionals. Important tips so you can get through. An outdoor disaster. 